Hello, future nurses. Welcome to unit three. Um, we're going to start out with unit three, which is the process of labor and birth. So I have some visual aids for you today, like my little baby here, that we're going to get to a little bit later. But let's go ahead and start this lecture. This is my second time recording this because I decided to go to the school to get a um, baby for you so that I could show you a little bit something that's a little uh, bit of a visual aid. So let's go ahead and get started. The units that we will be working with, I know you guys have already read, that is um, the chapters, chapter six, seven, and eight. So let's go ahead and get started. So I first wanna to talk to you guys about some of the trends that we're noting with laboring a patient and nursing care during labor and delivery. There was once a time where we used to only labor one patient at a time. Uh, now that is gone and you would always need to check your policy and procedure per your hospital if you um, do decide to move on into the RN program where you would be able to labor a patient. Um, unfortunately at this time, LVNs are not working in the labor and delivery areas at this point. Some LVNs are still working on the nursery side, depending on the hospital that you are working at. Um, also, some of them are working on the postpartum side. So when it comes to me instructing you guys about functions of labor and delivery, it is for your knowledge base that you will grow upon if you decide to go into this field and uh, further your education. So um, your book states that normally during laboring, you are allowed to care for two patients. So that's stating that you can labor two patients at a time. Um, once you are in this type of um, area, I know we talked to you guys a lot about cultural beliefs and um, things like that, and you guys are very cultural sensitive. You know how um, to work and function with that, so I'm not gonna have to repeat any of the cultural sensitivities for you. Um, but I would always want you to remain very sensitive to cultural beliefs during that time. Every person has a different cultural belief. All of the patients may feel differently or may um, be approached with the labor and the delivering differently than what you may think. Um, so it's best to kind of really know what's going on with that patient and kind of view the family. You always want to make sure that you follow up on any things that you may feel like are um, abusive or if you're just not getting a good vibe. But please be aware that some things may just truly be cultural driven. There are some terms that I uh, want you to really know and learn. Um, the components of labor, those we're going to go over those terms. Um, how these components work together and how the woman and the fetus adapt to labor. So these are some things that we're gonna discuss that I want you to really pay attention to when I am speaking. The knowledge of these terms is what helps the patient um, deal better with the nurse. So if you know the knowledge and you can pass it on to your patients and it helps for them to be able to go through the labor better and it allows a more safe delivery for them the more they know. So let's talk about the four P's. The four P's are something that I really want you guys to pay attention to, and those are the components of birth process. Now, if you guys ever see me looking over, it's because my book is on this side of me. So don't be alarmed, Miss Williams, where are you looking? I'm looking at my binder here. Um, so the four P's are power, passage, passenger, and psyche. So those are the four components that I need you to know. Please write them down. The four P's stand for power, passage, passenger, and psyche. We're gonna walk through each one of these, okay? Let's turn the page here. Okay, the powers are the focus, um, the power forces that we talk about when we're talking about the cervix, that power is what propels the cervix to open. So as the contraction is happening, there's two powers that's going on. The contraction is pushing the baby down and it's pulling the cervix up. Okay, so it's pushing the baby down to the birth canal 
and that cervix is being pulled up. Contractions are primary power during the birthing process. They are involuntary, which means the mother cannot stop the contractions from happening once we are in true labor. She cannot stop them from happening at all. Each contraction causes the placental blood flow to be temporarily interrupted for about zero to two seconds at a time, which means the fetus is cut off from any uh, return blood supply or oxygen as you will. If the contractions are too long, or there's not enough time in between, the fetus can become compromised, like they can have fetal hypoxia. Contractions push the baby down as the cervix pulls up. Please make a note of that. Um, there are three phases of uterine contractions. There's one that's called the increment. The um, increment is where it's the beginning of the contraction, where the contraction starts to increase. Then there's the acme. The acme is the peak of the contraction, which is where the contraction is at its strongest. And then there's the decrement. The decrement is where the contraction is falling or decreasing in strength. So I know that this is going to appear backwards when you guys are looking at it, but I've had this for a super duper long time, guys. Like, I don't even know what year I got this in. Um, so this is a little guide that I'm going to use so that you guys can kind of get an understanding of what I'm talking about. So as you see this contraction climbing here, this is what I would refer to as the increment right there as it is climbing as it is increasing up here this is the acme because that's the what the peak of the contraction okay you see that and then as it is falling or as it is decreasing in strength this is what we would refer to as the decrement of the contraction now you see this space here this is the space where it's talking about um the rest in between the contractions okay and the rest in between the contractions and there's two terms that I'm gonna get into here in a minute when I talk about the rest of the contraction but I wanted you to see and I'm gonna use this as a visual guide here um, again in a minute now like I said that's just a little bit of a um, visual aid that I use to kind of show people what the contraction can look like. This is not a um, contraction form or sheet. It's actually like my little antepartum sheet that, that shows fetal heart rate and what we say is uh, variables or what we say is a reactive strip, things like that. But simply because I can kind of demonstrate to you guys what it would kind of look like by using that. It just helps for you to kind of get it in your mind what that would kind of look like okay so now let's talk about um, assessing contractions so when we're assessing contractions we assess the frequency we assess the duration the intensity um, and the um, interval which is the relaxation period okay so when I talk about the frequency that is the time from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next contraction. That's the frequency. How far apart are they? Okay, now when we talk about the duration, we're talking about the length of time within the contraction. Okay, so the length of time within the contraction. So how long did that particular contraction last? When I'm talking about intensity, I'm talking about how strong was the contraction. And we describe the strength of a contraction from an external toco as mild, moderate, um, or strong. Now, while I'm talking about that, let me give you a little bit of a visual aid. Um, we check the um, strength of the contraction by the fundus, which is the top of the uterus. So, I have here a little picture where you're going to be able to kind of see the shape of the uterus. I can make this work right. Okay. So, okay, so here's my little visual aid here. So, um, this is on the inside of the mom. Okay, so this would be the top. 
this would be the fundus, which is the top of your uterus. That's what we would palpate. So when we're feeling a contraction, we're not feeling super low in her belly. You should be feeling at the top of her fundus to get the true intensity of her contraction. So if I say her contraction is mild, mild kind of feels like the tip of your nose where you can indent the tip of your nose. So you'd be able to indent the top of their fundus that same amount. Okay, that's what we would consider mild. That's what that would feel like. Um, and when I would say it is moderate, it's a little bit firmer. So it would be like um, filling your chin. So you could still indent just a tiny bit, but not as much as your nose. And so um, that would be what I would consider moderate. Yes, so when I, what I would consider strong is your forehead. So if you were to uh, try to indent your forehead, hence the term hard head, um, you cannot really indent. And that is a strong contraction. That is how you know her contractions are super strong. So when you're a new labor and delivery nurse, we have these tools and this is kind of how we learn um, the, the terms that we're using, what we're stating, because a lot of it is totally by feel. So in order for us to kind of have the same roundabout of what we're speaking of, that is how we do the fill in order to teach. Okay, so um, labor begins when the contractions are regular and they're about two to five minutes apart. Um, but you can have a patient who is contracting every two to five minutes and she could have been contracting that much and we say, well, she's not in real labor. The only real sign of true labor is what? It is cervical change. And so she must be contracting every two to five minutes um, consistently with cervical change in order for us to say that it is true labor. So I need you guys to understand that. When I say true labor, what is the only sign of true labor? The answer is cervical change. We got that? So I made a point of that, so <clears throat> write it down, okay. So when the cervix is 100% effaced, it kind of feels really, really slick. Um, membrane over the fetus, like tissue paper, it's really, really thin. You will breeze right past it. That's how we say the mom is 100% effaced. You must be 10 centimeters dilated and 100% effaced before you can push. Okay, so on my little visual aid here, Guys, I've also had, had this like a million years. I don't know, maybe 19, 18, something like that. But I've had this for a super long time. This is um, one of the tools that I use um, to really kind of grasp the understanding of my true uh, digital cervical exam so that I know um, what the cervix dilation was. This was one of the tools that I used. But back to what I was saying, this is what we would consider 10 centimeters dilated okay so when i say a uh, patient is 10 centimeters dilated that means that i can feel the circumference all the way around her head so basically the baby's head so basically when i'm checking her uh, my hands are so far apart this is what i mean that i could feel the whole circumference around the head that is my 10 where i could feel all the way around the baby's head so this right here is showing you that this is 10 centimeters okay and that's about right right and this is showing you that it's 100 percent effaced so this little pink line that's going around here is signaling that the mom is 100 percent effaced that means that there's no cervix left you cannot feel anything all you could feel is your baby's head so i like to show you guys kind of like the difference between 100 percent effaced and zero percent effaced just so that you can kind of have a grand understanding of what I'm talking about here. So you see this thickness here? This is what we would call 0% efface. You see how thick that cervix is around there? That's zero, that means her cervix is really thick and she still has a long way to go. So this is considered 0% effacement. All right. Let's keep on pushing. The nurse palpates um, the 
fund us when she is talking about the intensity and when she is giving report to the physician about how far along the contractions are apart, uh, what's the duration, the intensity. This is where she needs to use her mild, moderate, and firm technique in order to give the physician a true account of what's going on so that the doctor will know this is, you know, her cervix is going to change, she's in adequate labor or not. During the relaxation stage, the fetal oxygenation is restored. Uh, they must have relaxation time for the baby to be able to tolerate labor. Fetal compromise could result if the contractions have a duration longer than 90 seconds um, and intervals shorter than 60 seconds apart. So you guys can get a little bit of an understanding of that from skill 6-5, but I'm gonna show you something real quick. Let me see here. Oh. I didn't think I was gonna do this, so I don't have it set up, but I wanna show you guys something. show you guys so that you can understand a little bit better hold on I'm looking for something to fix this little board because I want to show you something it's going to really help you get a better understanding y'all see yes you can look at miss williams okay so let's say this is the contraction so this would be the increment right this would be the acme this would be the decrement so this right here is the interval in between where they're supposed to be relaxing then here's another contraction again like that right so what your book is suggesting to you if you have a mom who her contractions are doing this, then there is no rest period enough in here for the baby to um, get any kind of recovery. There's no relaxing right there. So your baby can go into fetal hypoxia. So that right there is something that we would report to the physician right away. The baby has not enough rest period in between the contractions. Now let's just say the contractions are uh, longer than 90 seconds, then the rest period is only 30 seconds, and then she'll have another 90 second contraction. We're gonna just say that's 90 seconds. Then is that still enough time right there for the baby to have rest period? The answer is no, because if any contractions are greater than, how many seconds did I just say? We don't want it greater than 90 seconds for a contraction, and we don't want our rest period to be shorter than 60 seconds in order for our baby to get rest in between the contractions, okay? So when you guys are looking at skill 6-5, that will help you to understand a little bit because, you know, um, my drawing ability is so amazing. It looked just like a real contraction. Like, I know y'all could barely even tell the difference that it was not on a real strip. I know. I know, I just do so well when it comes to art. Okay, so let's let get my glasses back on because y'all know I can't see. Okay, so when the cervix is fully dilated, which is what? We just discussed that, that's 10 centimeters. The mother is ready to start pushing at that time. The mother will get a strong sense of 
the feeling that she wants to bear down or you'll have mothers that state things like, I feel like I have to go to the restroom. Oh my gosh, I have to um, have a bowel movement, you know, or things like that. And then when you hear that, you know that you need to check that patient because that means that that baby's head is super far down. She's probably completely dilated and she's feeling the urge to push. Um, if a mother tries to push prior to her being completely dilated and completely effaced, what can happen to her is that um, she can swell her cervix up, which is just awful. And unfortunately, um, there's some old wise tales that state, oh, when you start feeling the urge to push, just go ahead and start pushing, you know, or if you hurry up and just start pushing early, it will make the baby be born uh, faster. And that's just not the truth. That is the complete opposite of what they really need to do. If they're feeling the urge to bear down, but they're not uh, 10 centimeters dilated, then you must go into teaching her how to breathe through those contractions to keep her from pushing through them in order to give that cervix more time to move away. Um, in order to let the baby kind of come on down. So um, we do that so that we will decrease the chance of fetal hypoxia. Um, sometimes um, if the mother swells up her cervix, it will take much longer for her to become um, completely dilated. And, at, and sometimes she won't. You know, sometimes she could swell her cervix up so bad that she would end up being uh, a C-section. And that's one of the things that we're really trying to fight against. And she could cause uh, maternal exhaustion by pushing too early. If you start pushing two, three hours out, by the time it's time to really push, you're super exhausted and you can't. Um, or she could cause fetal, um, exacerbate the fetal hypoxia by bearing down so much during contractions that she doesn't need to. Contractions cause the cervix to efface, which means get shorter and to thin out. And the contractions also push the baby down into the birth canal. So, I have my little baby. Where's your cervix? I have my little baby and my cervix here. So, this is my cervix when it's closed. Completely closed can't press my finger through it. My um, cervix is 0% effaced, okay? Now, when we're having a contraction, what is happening is, is every time we have a contraction, our baby is being pushed further and further down. Hold on, let me get my baby together for y'all. Okay, so the contraction will pull the cervix up, make the cervix shorter, and it will also push my baby down at the same time. Okay, so like now here, this mom, should this mom be pushing? No, what I call this cervix, 100% um, e-face, nope. And how much dilated would I call her? Mm, she's about a six. So what I um, ask this mom to push, even if she's feeling uh, the urge to push, no, don't look at my baby's foot. Look at the head, right there. Okay, so, no, but this is what it's doing. The contractions are making the cervix push up and it's making the baby um, go down into the birth canal. So two things are happening during the contraction and I need you to know both. Two things are happening. The contraction is causing the cervix to efface, which we means get shorter and thinner. And the contraction is pushing the baby into the birth canal. Make sure that you know both of them. Um, also in your book, there's a figure that shows you what 10 centimeters dilated is. I like to show you guys from my little visual aid here as well. And I'm gonna start at the one so that you guys can kind of have a different visual aid than what is in the book. So this is my one centimeter. When I first started learning how to do cervical exams, I had another um, help aid that was sort of like this, but uh, a little bit more primitive, if you know what I mean. And so um, this is how a lot of labor and delivery nurses um, learn what the feel of their uh, centimeter dilation is. So this is what I would consider a one. This is one centimeter, which means I can get my fingertip through. Okay, just my fingertip, not a whole finger, but just my fingertip through is what is, what's my one centimeter. 
This is the graph for two centimeters. And as you guys can see, please pay attention to the effacement. And I know that this is backwards when you're looking at it, but just follow along with me. So this is the effacement. Um, so this is 10. Make, just keep, a, keep an eye on that. So my two centimeters, uh, my fingers are a little bit overlaps. My two fingers are. My fingers are not side by side. This is my two. As you can see, that's my two. So that's two centimeters here. Three centimeters, my fingers are slightly apart. That's two, I mean, that's three centimeters, okay, right there. Two centimeters, and look at the cervix. Look at it's thinning as she's becoming more dilated. I skipped one. This is four, four centimeters. Four. Five is more like my peace sign. Five. Six centimeters. Look at the effacement. That's 70%. Look at how thin it is now. So that's my six. Seven centimeters. Should the mom start pushing now? Oh, she's seven. Let's go pushing. No, let's not. We're going to make her have maternal exhaustion and we could start, um, swell up her cervix. Now, look at here on eight centimeters. Now, our mom is about 100% effaced. So, does that mean she can push because she's not yet 10 centimeters? She's only eight. That is about my eight. Skipped one again. Nine. Now, with nine centimeters, some people um, will call their nine a 10 and their 10 a nine. You have to really have done labor and delivery for a while to kind of be straight on a lot of times. With my 10, I know that I'm going to scoop all the way around that baby's head. I'm going to almost fill the ears. Um, so this is my 10. Okay, this little thin covering here, that just kind of signals my amniotic membrane. So that's a little bit of a visual aid that will kind of um, help you guys a little bit. See something a little bit different than what you're seeing in your book. So let's go ahead and let's talk about the um, another one of the P's that we were talking about. Uh, let's talk about passage. So when we're going ahead talking about passage, we're talking about um, the way in, this, in which the baby passes. So we're going to talk about the bony pelvis. And the bony pelvis is divided into two parts. It's the false pelvis is the first part. And that's the upper flare part. And then the true pelvis is the second part. And that's the lower part. The reason that we talk about the pelvis a lot is because we have to know the pelvis and the baby's head proportionate, proportioned together. So on some instances, you will have a mom who is cephalopelvic disproportionate, and that is if the baby's head is too big to fit through the pelvis, or if it's just unproportionate, hence the term cephalo head, pelvic, pelvis, disproportion, not proportionate. So when you see that term, you know that that means that the, it's trying to express to you that the baby's head and the mother's pelvis cannot work well together. Um, if you have cephalopelvic disproportion, for the most part, that mom is going to end up in a C-section, okay? And on the unit before, we spoke about the different types of pelvises. So if you need to go refresh on that, you can kind of go look back on that. We did discuss the pelvics that are most likely able to deliver without any problem, the pelvics that um, are okay, and the pelvises that will not deliver vaginally. Uh, passage consists of the mother's bony promises and the soft tissues like the cervix, the muscles, the ligament, and the fascia of her pelvis and her perineum. The true pelvis is directly involved with childbirth, the true pelvis, which is what, which is the lower part that we just discussed. Women who have had previous vaginal deliveries, they usually deliver more easily since the soft tissues move a lot better. They've already been stretched out and manipulated, making it easier for the birth of the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, however many babies that come after that first one. Remember all of our pelvic shapes um, from last time, okay? Please make sure that you go back and look at that. Now let's talk a little bit about the passenger. The passenger, um, the head is the biggest part of the passing. 
So once we get that head out, for the most part, we do believe that we're okay, unless we get a baby that has really broad shoulders. Um, ben, and the bi, um, the bipedal diameter is the largest part of the head. The um, head bones composed of the connective tissue, which we call the sutures, and the fontanelles are open areas um, where the sutures meet. So we have the anterior fontanelle, which is the diamond shape in the front, and we have the posterior fontanelle, which is the triangle shape in the back. So we use our little baby here. I want to make sure we got some good lighting. So this right here, you see this? This is a diamond shape. Okay, so this diamond shape is what we also call the soft spot, right? So this is what we would like to call our anterior fontanelle. Okay, so now the posterior fontanelle is on the back, and that is more triangle shaped. Hoping that the light catches that a little bit better. So this is more what we would like to call a triangle shape, and this is on the uh, posterior fontanelle. The fontanelle, the posterior fontanelle closes in about two months of the baby's birth. The sutures and the fontanelles are very, very important. It allows the fetal head to change shape as it passes through the pelvis. This is called molding, so you'll get those babies that will have what we call um, the elongated heads, the molding of the head, which is okay, they will be all right. Um, you may see some babies with extreme molding if they sat in the birth canal long enough. These are the babies that have those extreme long heads and then people feel like they have to rub the baby's head to mold the baby's head back. You really don't, but people just tend to believe that on any rate. Uh, the passenger is the fetus along with the placenta, uh, the membranes, and the amniotic fluid. The anterior fontanelles, which we call what? We call that the soft spot, which is what? The diamond shaped one at the front. That suture allows the skull to change shape as it passes through the birth canal. Um, attitude, attitude, A-T-T-I-T-U-D-E. When we uh, refer to that word during the, talking about the passenger, that is the flexion of the head and the extremities. If they are extended, it can prolong labor. So I want to show you this it is in your book as well but sometimes when i show people with the baby it makes more sense so as the baby is um coming down the birth canal we want them to come like this let me get my baby straight because i want y'all to think that i'm mistreating my child here okay so the baby normally comes out flexed Flex like that. You see his little chin is tucked, tucked down to his chest. It's much easier for him to get out. Okay, so now if we have a baby that's flexed up, where their head is flexed like this, this is a much harder delivery. Or they try to come out just like this, sunny side up, flex like that. They're being very nosy. When we say, oh, it's a nosy baby, it's because their nose is pointing up because they're flexed upward. That's a much harder delivery because this is a bigger surface area than what? than this okay so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the aptitude the flexion of the fetal head and the extremities so when we talk about the word fetal lie make sure you write this down too fetal lie is how the baby is positioned in relation to the mother's spine so um this is also um one of the things that's really going to let us know if the mother is going to do well, if she's going to be able to deliver fine, um, is the fetal lie. So 99% of the births um, are longitudinal. So when I'm talking about longitudinal and I'm talking about a, uh, I'm going to demonstrate here using myself. So the, this is longitudinal to the mom's spine. So that means the baby is coming down just like this. This is what I would consider longitudinal. Okay, now this is transverse. Your baby is all to the side. You cannot push that out. Okay, so what the physician will try to do is what we call an external version. So they will try to turn this baby in utero from the outside in order to make the baby be longitude, in order for you to be able to push the baby out. If the baby is transverse or if the baby is breech and we cannot turn the baby around, then that mom is going to be a C-section. Okay, external versions are still done. Some mothers state that they are a little bit pain, 
full. Um, most moms, if we're gonna know that we're gonna attempt to do an external version, she will have an ep epidural on board. And a nurse is never allowed to do a version. Only physicians uh, do versions. A nurse is there to always assist. There are different ways the fetus can uh, present. Um, and whatever way they present, we call that the presenting part. So if the baby is head down, the head is the presenting part. If the baby is breached, then the poor bottom is the presenting part. Okay, that's how we describe, describe the presenting part. Fetal presentation uh, refers to the part of the fetus that enters the pelvis first. So that is seen on figure 6-7, box 6-1 as well. On um, there, they should have the classifications of fetal presentation and positions, okay? So please look that over for me. Um, let me give you guys a few little terms. So when we're talking about the way the baby is presenting, you will hear in labor and delivery terms like LOA, ROA. So LOA stands for left occiput anterior. That is very favorable. That means the cervix, I mean the uh, vertex means head first. So if it says the baby's vertex, that means the baby is head first. Also, I want you to know the um, like LOA, left occiput anterior, ROA, right occiput anterior, okay? And I know it's breaking that down for you. So please review all the positions, but what I need you to know is that LOA, left occiput anterior is the most favorable way to deliver a baby. That's what I need you to know. I also need you to know the term vertex means head first. You got that? Okay, so um, view uh, figure 8-6 as well. It has the mechanisms of breech delivery on there. Um, there are a few other presentations that I just kind of want to hit on a little bit. So we have um, the breech presentation. We have transverse lie. We have, um, when we say transverse, I just showed you guys that. That means the fetus is sideways and the shoulder may be presenting first. You could have frank breach and frank breach basically stands for buttocks presents first and the legs are straight upward and the arms are extended anterior and posterior fontanelles are used to determine the presenting part as well as the ultrasound so i'm kind of want to show you a little bit with my little pelvis here. I have a little pelvis. Okay, so here's my pelvis. She is much favorable. So if I'm saying that my baby is um, Frank Breach, he is most likely sitting in her pelvis like so. What is the presenting part? The buttocks. So that is what we would consider a frank breech baby. Now, if my baby was transverse, that means my baby is laying to the side. Let me push him down in my cervix, guys. He cannot even get all the way down into her pelvis because he's laying to the side. And his presenting part would be his shoulder. You see that? He's transverse. He's to the side. So he can't even get all the way into her pelvis. Am I correct? Now, if we say, okay, our baby is vertex, that means our baby is what? Head down. This is our vertex baby. 
in our pelvis. I hope that little visual aid helps you guys out so that you'll know or it will ring a bell to you when you are taking your test or when you are speaking to people about it or if you guys get a position on a postpartum floor. So like we just said, with Frank Breach, the buttocks is a presenting part and the feet are over the head and the baby is like in a pike position. So they are like so. He is looking like this. Pike position. Arms could be doing anything, but his legs are straight up just like that. Now, if we have a baby that's uh, in this type of position, she's going for a C-section. There is no, there's no moving that. Once the baby is already sitting in the birth canal like that, I cannot pick this baby up out of her pelvis. She is going to be a C-section delivery, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about an external version a little bit. Um, I know we've already discussed it, but I just want to make sure that you guys understand it. An external version is what we would consider a maneuver uh, to move the mom. It is a maneuver that manipulates the fetus um, in, into a presenting position that is more favorable for a delivery externally by the mom's, uh, putting your hands on the mom's abdomen. Now that is what it is called. Now the name of the maneuver is called the Leopold's Maneuver. Mothers are normally given a tocolytic uh, in order to keep her from contracting uh, while we attempt to do this uh, because if you're contracting then your um, uterus is very hard and you cannot maneuver a baby in that position. And so that's why we give her tocolytics. And sometimes pain medication is used prior to the version unless the physician has ordered an epidural. Sometimes these work and sometimes they don't. I mean, in all honesty, I have seen some work, but unfortunately I've seen more to not work or the baby will turn and then almost immediately that baby will just turn right back. Um, and they will go right back into the uh, position that they were before. If we have a successful um, external version, then that mom is most likely put on Pitocin right after that in order to go ahead and force the baby to stay in that position and to make the contractions do what? Move the baby down into the birth canal and help move that cervix up, okay? So we will start right away with the Pitocin, okay? External versions, like I said, they can um, work or not work. And some mothers say that it's uncomfortable. Some mothers say that they don't feel it. Um, but the real true name of the external version is called the Leopold's Maneuver. If we have a baby that we're attempting the... Um, external maneuver on and they do not move uh, we give it the one good try and then after that that mom is going to be scheduled for a c-section now let's talk about another p another p is position it's refers to how a um the reference part or the reference point of the fetal presenting part is oriented within the mother's pelvis so occiput refers to how the head is oriented if the fetus is in the head down position and sacrum is used to describe how the fetus is breech presentation is oriented to the pelvis occiput describes how the head is oriented if the fetus is in a head down position please make sure that you know that sacrum is used to describe how the fetus in a breech position is oriented in the pelvis. So I need you guys to make sure you know that. Sacrum, sacrum. You should, you should get, I mean, like, just think about it. Sacrum, you would think the lower half. So that would be a breech position. Occiput would be a head down position. Presentation refers to the presenting part. And the pelvis is divided into four imaginary quadrants when we're talking about the mom's pelvis. 
the right and the left, anterior and posterior. The reference point is what equals to anterior or posterior of the fontanelle. And which side of the pelvis is where we get the right or the left, hence the term LOA, left occiput anterior, or ROA, right occiput anterior. But as I discussed before, the most favorable is what? LOA. Please make sure you know that. Let me get past some of these pictures that I made copies of for you guys because I thought I was going to be able to show you in class, but um, thanks to uh, Corona, we're not. So I'm going to just go past some of these. Okay, so let's talk about station. Um, when we're talking about station during a delivery, the station is the level of the presenting part. Usually the head, you know, unless the baby is breech, in the pelvis. It's estimated in centimeters from the level of the ischial spine in the pelvis. When the presenting part is at the ischial spine, the station is zero. This is called engagement. So, you guys, I want you guys to really be familiar with the stations. All right, so, hence again, let's go with that baby. So, if our baby is in the pelvis like so, if our baby is way up, our baby here is way up, She's not even at zero station. Once our baby comes down here, this is where we would consider our baby at zero station and we're grading that per centimeters from our ischial spine, okay? So station is how far down in centimeters the baby is. That's what station actually means. Station, where is the baby stationed? How far down? And that is measured in centimeters. And it is measured in centimeters per the ischial spine. That is what you need to know. Zero station means that the baby is engaged. Engaged in the pelvis. That's what zero station means. And zero station is right around here. I know you can't see as well but you could, that's where you would be zero station. So the baby is engaged. If the baby is super high up in the pelvis, we would call this minus three or floating. And that's like this. The baby is super high in the pelvis. They're not even engaged. You see, they're nowhere near. So they're floating up in the pelvis. They still can bobble up and down in there. So they're not um, engaged. Engaged, that baby comes down and there's no likelihood of that baby kind of floating back up. So we need the baby engaged in the pelvis. So if the baby is minus three or greater, we consider that floating. Now let's talk about the last P, which is the psyche. During childbirth, it involves the entire being um, and the mental state of the mother is a huge influence. Um, so we really need her to be as calm as we can, make sure that she's in a good headspace um, during her labor. Fear and anxiety causes secretions of stress hormones. And um, it is believed that sometimes the more stressed the mother is with those stress hormones, the more, the harder it is for her to labor naturally. And, you know, it may take her a little bit longer that is just what is kind of believed. So that's why educating your mom is the best thing that you could do for her. It makes her feel a little bit more comfortable and then she can go through her labor a little bit better. If she's well informed, she's relaxed more. And if the mom is relaxed, then she can, uh, it could really decrease her labor time. So education and helping control her environment is what a good labor delivery nurse can do. So let's talk about impending uh, signs of labor. So we have um, Braxton Hicks. Braxton Hicks contractions, those are very irregular and they start and they stop sometimes. There's no rhyme or reason behind them a lot of times. And they do assist in preparing the cervix for labor, uh, but they are not true labor. Like we discussed, true labor is what? Cervical change. Increase in vaginal discharge is another impending sign of labor. 
bloody show is a sign and bloody show is the result of tiny capillaries breaking as the cervix dilates so that is what bloody show actually is rupture of membranes that is also an impending sign of labor um PROM, that's a premature rupture of membranes. That is a higher risk for infection and chance of the cord prolapsing and um, compression by the fetal head. Um, so we really, really want to be careful when we talk about PROM. Nesting is another impending sign of labor that a lot of people do still really believe in. And that's when a mom will have a burst of energy and she'll start cleaning and prepping for the baby and, you know, washing all the baby clothes and kind of getting everything together, just this surge of energy that she has. Um, weight loss, water loss due to hormonal changes. It's not a huge weight loss. It's normally like one to three pounds of weight loss. Um, the mucus plug may be lost. This does not always happen for everyone. And losing the mucus plug does not necessarily mean that delivery is about to happen. It can be lost about several weeks prior to actual labor beginning. And the truth of the matter is, is that some women don't even really know when they lose their mucus plug um, because sometimes you'll have increased vaginal discharge or um, when you are pregnant. And so they will see uh, like a mucusy discharge and they will automatically assume that that's their mucus plug when it's really not. Um, labor is normally between 38 and 42 weeks after the last known menstrual cycle. It is very rare now that we see someone go past 40 weeks. Um, the doctors don't normally want the mom to stay pregnant that long due to calcifications that can happen within the placenta. So you will see a lot of people um, delivering more around the 38 to 40, but um, your book states labor is normally between 38 and 42 weeks after LNMP, which is last known. I'm sorry. Yes, it is. I can't think. But it is the LNMP, which is the last uh, known menstrual period. Um, let's talk about when the mom needs to go to the hospital. Um, this kind of varies. It's different according to what the doctors state for the moms or if it's her first baby or if she's had several babies or if she's had a precipitous labor, these things are kind of, these things will differ, okay? So go to the hospital. This is what we teach our new moms. Go to the hospital if you have contractions for more than one hour. For a prima gravida, that is a first time mom, if the contractions are regular about two to five minutes apart and they've been happening greater than about an hour. Now for our multi-gravita, that is um, a mom who's had several babies. Um, contractions are regular and they get longer and stronger. She should go to the hospital when her contractions are about 10 minutes apart for about one hour because her body is going to um, maybe move a little bit faster. If she ruptures her membrane at all, she is to go to the hospital immediately. What some moms do is they make the horrible mistake of, oh my, okay, so my water broke, so I'm gonna get in the shower and I'm gonna, you know, clean up the house and I'm gonna call my husband and I'm gonna wait. No, no, no. If your water breaks, you are to immediately go to the hospital. This is what you teach all pregnant women because anything can happen. The cord could slip and get compressed by the head and there's no way for them to know that. Okay, they're not gonna feel it. Um, and then that could result in them losing the life of their child. So if their water break, go immediately. If they notice any bright red blood, go immediately. If they have a decrease in fetal movement, sometimes this does happen, but if it continues, she should seek medical attention. The provider may have her to do a kick count at home first. Um, but if she's um, ever concerned, like she's done the fetal kick count or she knows that her baby normally moves after she eats and the baby is not, we do not mince words. We just say, okay, straight to the hospital you go and let us check you out. And if you have any other concerns, that mother should go to the hospital. Some moms will say things like, I just feel like something is not right. I know I've told you guys this before. If a mother ever says to you, a pregnant woman ever says to you, I don't know, but I just feel like something is not right, go to the hospital that you're that's it so that we could check you out with true labor the contractions will become more frequent and they will be and um, increase 
in pain and the mother will dilate and her um, cervix will change. All right, so let's talk about table 6-6. So there are several parts when we're talking about stages of labor. There are four stages of labor. The first stage um, has three parts. So the first stage has three parts. We have the latent phase, and that is four to six hours. The active phase, which could be two to six hours. And the transition phase, which could be about 30 minutes to two hours. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the mom's behaviors during those stages. And the latent stage, a lot of times you can get those moms who are kind of, they're super excited or they're super frightened, um, but they kind of are just kind of going with the flow a little bit, trying to figure out what's going on. During the active phase, these moms start to kind of become a little bit more intense because things are changing, the pain is increasing. Um, during a transition phase, this is where you really may need to make sure that you can keep your mom together and um, just advise her like that she's, she's meant to do this. She can get through this okay. The highest priority is during the fourth stage of labor. Now the fourth stage of labor, we're gonna get to that in a minute, uh, but um, I want you guys to make sure that you make a note of that in particular. Now on the second stage of labor, we call this the expulsion stage. And that is when the patient is fully dilated and she has the birth of the infant. She's fully dilated to the birth of the infant. During the third stage, which we like to call the placental stage, and that is the birth of the infant and the birth of the placenta. So that right there is where we really, really are discussing paying attention, you're delivering the baby, and you're delivering the placenta. The fourth stage is what is the highest priority. So please make a note of that. The fourth stage is the highest priority because this is where our mom can hemorrhage. Um, the fourth stage is immediate post-birth recovery period. This is where the mom really does still need to be watched. Sometimes after the birth of the baby, some people will really try to give their attention to, oh, we've had the baby, everything is okay. No, this is where we really still need to be watching the mom, palpating, making sure that her fundus is going down, checking her bleeding, because she's really at a high risk for um, hemorrhaging at this time. If a woman feels like she is going to push and um, you notice stuff like, um, something's not quite right, she's still feeling the urge to push in her uh, pelvis, you might wanna let the doctor know and you're gonna go ahead and check her out and make sure her bleeding is sufficient, okay? Because right after the delivery, the mom sometimes doesn't quite know what's going on. But there's one thing that I want you guys to really, really write a note of, because I saw this um, in so many of the questions that are in the test bank. Um, if you have a patient and she is not fully dilated, she should be coached to not bear down because it could cause swelling of her cervix. It could also cause a laceration of the cervix. If the cervix swells, it will be a much harder time moving back because she's now gone backwards uh, for opening it up for the baby to pass through. And if she lacerates that cervix, which means she rips her cervix, now she's going to bleed more, and now the doctor's going to need to repair the cervix after delivery of the baby. Please make note to look at skill 6-1 so that you can um, read assisting with an emergency birth. Let's see here. What does that say? Almost been going an hour now. Okay, so let's talk about a few of the terms of mechanisms of labor, like descent. Descent means the station is it in the negative. Uh, engagement, that's if the station is at zero or halfway down the pelvis. Flexion, we talked about flexion, about the baby's head. Um, if the baby um, head should be flexed down to um, chin to chest, this is flexion here. This is how we want our baby to come out. 
flexion, chin to chest, like that, not like this, okay? Internal rotation, that is the head is slightly turned from internally, internal rotation, moving the head from internally. Extension, that's the fetal head changes from flexion to extension. External rotation, that means the head turns to one side. An expulsion, that's the shoulders are born at one time. Then the rest of the body is quickly born. So just make sure that you know the mechanisms of labor. Just kind of get familiar with those few terms that I've just gone over with you right there. Uh, we discussed already what true labor was. And so I kind of want to let you guys know what a little bit of the uh, false labor is. So true labor means what? The uh, characteristics of changing from the cervix, which means the, babe, the woman is having contractions and her cervix is changing. If her cervix is not changing, she is not in true labor. Um, the woman is usually sent home after about one to two hours of monitoring for changes if the cervix does not change um, or if her contractions stay the same or go away. Now, um, some people get kind of confused because they're like, oh, well, they sent me home and I was contracting. Okay, well, you were in false labor because if your cervix did not change after us monitoring you for an hour or greater, then you are in false labor. Um, so the patient should be encouraged to return if they notice that there's anything that changes or if she thinks her false labor has changed to true labor, it's always better to be safe than sorry. Some moms will say, well, I'm not coming back because you guys just keep sending me home. Well, then you need to educate them. Hey, false labor could turn into true labor at any point. So if these contractions get closer together, if these contractions um, get higher in intensity, if your water breaks, if you notice bright red bleeding, all of these things, you need to return. Better safe than sorry. So let's talk about assessment of a laboring patient. Uh, the first thing that you're going to do when you start assessing a laboring patient, you're going to get their EDC, which is the expected date of confinement. You're going to ask them when did the labor begin? When did they start having pain? How frequent are they? How long have they been lasting? What's her intensity of the contraction? That's what you're going to note when you're doing your assessment. So that means that you're going to put on the monitor and you're going to note the frequency, the duration, which is how long the contraction is, the intensity, they're mild, they're moderate, they're strong. Um, and then you're going to note if the membranes are intact or if the uh, membranes are ruptured. If you notice the membranes are ruptured, you want to ask the mom how long has her membranes been ruptured. Um, you're going to note the time of the rupture, the color of the fluid, uh, any smell of the fluid, or any consistency of those uh, fluid. Uh, assessment of amniotic fluid um, is very important. And the time that the woman ruptured, you must find that out if she ruptured outside of the hospital. Um, when in doing the assessment, you're going to also note the fetal heart rate. Uh, normal. Um, heart rate you're okay with and you're going to determine the fetal heart rate. Please read over uh, that it is in your book and it's skill 6-6. -6. So you want to note what the lower limit is and then you want to note what the upper limit is of the baby's heart rate. Make sure that you know that. And then also you're going to monitor the mother's vital signs. Now, when you are um, monitoring the mom, you're gonna make sure that you put the um, toco on her to monitor her contractions. And then you're gonna put the external fetal monitor also on her abdomen so that you can pick up the fetal heart tones. Um, we do this as soon as we get the moms on the floor. This is one of the first things that we do and we do it while we're asking all of the rest of the assessment questions. So please note that there's a picture there for you guys to see that and the skill is skill 6-3 make sure that you note that also during the assessment you're going to notice the emotional status of the woman okay who's with her if they're causing her any distress you're going to note that as well you're going to do a vaginal exam so that you can note what is her cervical dilation at the time of arrival 
What was her effacement? What was the presentation? What was the station? These things that we've just gone over. Um, also, also, um, we're going to note at the time, sorry guys, I was looking over something else, uh, that we want to know if the mom is going to be uh, breastfed or is she going to, is she going to breastfeed the baby or if she's going to bottle feed the baby. These are things we want to know right away. Also, does she have a pediatrician listed for the baby? Or are we going to use the one that's on call so that we can make sure the proper um, calls have been made? Uh, we want to know when's the last time she ate. The reason that we want to know that is because if something were to happen and she's going to, and if she ends up being an emergency C-section, that's one of the first things that the crew wants to know and that the physician is going to need to know if we have to put her to sleep. What time did she eat last? And has she had a bowel movement? After the assessment, um, that's when we kind of get all the rest of our paperwork done. We're going to sign for um, her permits, you know, do all the permit signing. We're going to get her labs drawn at that time. We're going to try to get a urine specimen taken. Um, at that time, we'll also then do an IV. Um, if it is ordered, we'll start an IV or at least a saline lock um, in case... Um, the doctor wants us to go ahead and start fluids on our patient, depending on what's going on. And occasionally, you will still get some physicians that ask for an enema um, to be given to the patient. And this is so that they can release stool prior to uh, becoming um, 10 centimeters dilated and prior to her um, needing to push. Uh, but this is an old practice and it's not really done much anymore. Um, this was one of the only altercations that I've ever had with a physician um, where the physician wanted me to um, give this patient an enema. And he was a very old school doctor and I educated the patient on it. She asked me what it was. She asked me if she had to do it. I told her that it was her body, her choice. And she declined. And so at that time, the physician was so irate that I did that. He basically told me that um, he was not going to deliver her, that I was going to stand there and catch that baby. So if she went, she would just go all over me instead of him. He was so upset. He slammed the chart down. It was a huge mess. Um, but the truth about the matter is it is your patient's choice, and they are to be educated. You can't just do things to them. Um without their consent, like you just can't. So when you're assessing the amniotic fluid, you need to know if it's normal. Normal is clear. So you would want the amniotic fluid to be clear if it's normal. Um, but if they tell you that it was green tinged or um, they noticed that it had green um, particles in it, then you would know that the baby possibly ch uh, passed its first meconium, and which is the baby's first stool. So that's very significant that we know that for when we get ready to deliver the baby. Um, if it's cloudy or yellow, it may indicate that the um, that there's an infection, and so that a baby has a there's infection inside the inside the womb. Okay, so we need to know that as well, and then we're gonna. Make sure that we note the odor of amniotic fluid. In order for us to check for um, rupture of membranes, we use the nitrazine test uh, because unfortunately some moms think that they have ruptured their membranes and they really haven't. It's basically just urine that they have passed when they sneeze or when they cough or when they laugh. Um, and so a nitrazine test is done and it's a little piece of paper and the paper will turn a blue, green or a dark blue when it comes in contact with alkaline amniotic fluid. Um, this is also called the fern test. Um, a sample um, of the amniotic fluid is taken and it's put on a slide. This is what's the fern test. Um, and the reason it's called the fern test is because as it dries, it will resemble like a fern and it must be seen under a microscope. But a lot of times we don't do the fern test, we just do the um, nitrazine paper, okay? And um, if the amniotic fluid um, is ruptured, then the patient's to stay, regardless if she's having contractions at all, okay? 
Now let's talk about um, monitoring fetal heart rate. When they're in labor, we're gonna always do continued fetal monitoring. Make sure that you write that down. If the mother is in labor, we're gonna always do continual fetal monitoring. And it is now done on the computer and it provides a recording which becomes a permanent part of the record for as long as that record is available and records are available for 18 years. So any delivery that you've ever done or you've been a part of, those people can come back for 18 years. So make sure that your charting is spot on. Um, another way of monitoring is internal monitoring. Internal monitoring is when we do a fetal scalp electrode and um, it requires that the mother have already been ruptured, like her membranes are already ruptured because what you're basically doing is you're applying that fetal monitor to the baby's scalp. Okay, so that's the internal. Usually, um, when we have the, when we put the mother on a, a toco transducer, we're gonna feel for the top of her fundus and make sure that we find a good place so that we can get a good reading on how strong these contractions are. And let me see another thing I want you guys to know about this. Um, in order to have an idea of where to listen for the heart rate, the nurse must first be very familiar with the uh, fetal presenting position. And so once you're feeling the outside of the uterus, you can kind of get an idea of how that baby is lying in there um, in order for you to know exactly where you want to put your external fetal monitor in order to listen to the fetal heart tone instead of just searching all around her abdomen. Because sometimes when nurses do that, they make the mom a little bit frantic because she thinks that you can't find her baby's heart rate or there's something wrong with her baby's heart rate when that is not the true deal. So kind of get an idea of the uh, positioning of your baby and then put the uh, external fetal monitor on. Let's see. Okay, so uh, talking about monitoring the mom, when you are doing monitoring, you um, have to chart. So you are gonna want to uh, do fetal heart rate monitoring of a low risk mom. You will do it every hour during the latent phase and every 30 minutes during the active phase. And in the second stage, you would want to chart every 15 minutes on the fetal heart rate. But if you have a mom who is a high risk mom, then during the latent phase, you're gonna monitor her fetal heart tones every 30 minutes and every 15 minutes in the active phase and every five minutes in the second stage. So you guys can please view uh, box 6-2 for the breakdown of that as well. Let's see here. Some of these are just my pictures, like I stated, so I'm gonna move past them. So let's talk about your fetal heart rate monitoring routine. Um, oscillations, when the membranes are ruptured, um, you would want to do it before and after ambulation. If she's not, this is if she's not on continued um, monitoring. Before and after medication or anesthesia, are changes in medication, you really need to um, pay very close attention. At the time of the peak of action of the anesthetic drug, after a badge exam, after expulsion of the enema, and after catheterization, and if the uterine contractions are abnormal or excessive. So you need to make sure that you get in a routine of writing down those vital signs again after each one of those things are happening. I'm sorry, the fetal heart tones. Um, and it's simply because you have to constantly check the fetal well-being. Remember that when you are laboring a patient, you are not just laboring one, you're laboring two people, one that you can see and one that you cannot. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the um, IUPC. The IUPC is the interuterine monitor that we can monitor um, contraction strength. Now, normally when we're talking about contraction strength, we're talking about with a toco, and we're talking about mild, moderate, and strong. 
okay but the only other time that you can really know what the true intensity of them are is if your patient has an IUPC and the IUPC gives an accurate intensity of the contraction this patient membranes have to be ruptured in order for you to be able to use this tool and it is only uh, placed by a physician and a nurse um, let me see and nurse can give you an actual pressure measurement reading to the physicians of the contractions after it has been applied it is much better than an external toco we do not use them if we do not need to now we discussed the fetal scalp electrode a fetal scalp electrode of course is better than an external fetal monitor because it is directly connected to the scalp of the baby um, and it will monitor the heart rate more accurately. A lot of times you will see us using a um, FSC, which is a fetal scalp electrode. If we cannot keep the baby on the monitor, uh, we will also use an FSC if we're having some difficulties with um, the baby's heart rate. Same thing with the um, IUPC, the internal um, contraction monitor. We will use that if we're having problems or if we need to know exactly how strong these contractions are. And for both of those, please make note that the membrane must be ruptured for the FSC, fetal scap electrode, and the IUPC. They must already be ruptured. Now hold on guys, I'm trying to see if I'm going to go ahead and do a break here. I kind of doubt it. We're going to let y'all uh, be entertained by some of my music for a minute. Okay, so let's talk about changes in the baseline or the fetal heart rate. So when we're looking at assessing the fetal heart rate, we're looking at uh, accelerations, um, we're looking at early decelerations, variable decelerations, and late decelerations, which are really bad. So accelerations is the increase of at least 15 beats per minute over the baseline, which lasts about 15 seconds. And that's a reassuring pattern, suggesting that the baby is having some good oxygenation. So this is a true uh, reading of what that will look like. So this is an acceleration, okay? So an acceleration is 15 beats above the baseline. Here's your baseline, lasting for at least 15 seconds. That shows that we have a, a good baby. The baby's happy, up and up and up, up and back to regular, up and back to regular. That's a happy baby. So let's talk about early decelerations. Early decelerations are when the rate decreased during a contraction, they always return to baseline by the end of the contraction. It basically will mirror the contraction. That is a reassuring sign that we have some head compressions, okay? So every time the contraction goes up, the baby's heart rate will come down. It's like a mirror at the same time. We call that an early deceleration and that is okay. We'll, we say, okay, that means that there's some head um, compression and at that time, we're going to monitor the fetal descent, see how low down our baby is, okay? Now, when we talk about variables, these will begin and end very abruptly. They can be shaped as a V, they can be shaped as a W, as a U, variable. It varies, hence the term variables, okay? And this suggests that the uh, umbilical cord is compressed and this is non-reassuring. So at this time, I'm going to change my mom position. I need you to understand that. If you have a variable, which means it varies, it happens when it wants to, it's shaped how it wants to be shaped, like a V, like a U, like a W, it varies. And there's no rhyme or reason or when it is. That is not reassuring. There's a core compression somewhere. What are we going to do? We're going to change the mom's position. I need you to make sure that you understand that. Write it down, highlight it, do whatever you need to do. 
Now let's talk about a late deceleration. A late deceleration kind of looks similar to an early decel, but uh, we don't like it because basically it does not return with the contraction. It will return late, hence the term late deceleration. It's returning, the contraction has stopped and that baby's heart rate is still down and it comes up very slowly. During this time, this suggests that we have some placental uh, O2 insufficiency and that is not reassuring as well. So we're gonna turn our mom on her side and we're gonna give her oxygen because if it's taking a long time for our baby to come back up, that means that our baby's not oxygenated well. And so our baby is suffering a little bit. Our baby is telling us, hey, I need a little bit more help here. So you have to give the mom more oxygen in order for oxygen to, to be delivered to the baby, okay? So late suggests just that. And I need you guys to really pay attention to what I'm saying. If I if you see a late D cell, that means it is coming back up late. We do not like that. Our baby does not like that. We're gonna give some oxygen and we're gonna change the position. Okay, if we have early D cells, it looks like a mirror. The heart rate's coming down as the contraction's going up, and then as the contraction goes down, the heart rate comes back up. Same time, looks like a mirror. That is okay, that means head compression. We're gonna change the mom position a little bit, and we're gonna check for station to see how low down our baby is. All right, variable, it varies. We don't know what it's gonna look like. V, U, W, it's happening all over the place. Variables, change the position. Okay, so let me see here. Um, let me give you guys a couple of questions. So if the baseline is uh, 140, the, the baby's heart rate's in 140, and the accelerations would be um, at least how many beats up um, in order for us to call it an acceleration and how long would it last? So if the heart rate's in 140s, we know that we're looking for a 15 by 15. So that means the baby's heart rate would be up to 155 and it will last about 15 seconds or greater. That is an acceleration. Let's see, um, baseline is the rate uh, between the contraction and the, uh, between the periodic changes. So that's when you wanna look for the baseline. So this right here is what we would consider the baseline of this baby. So this right here is kind of like this baby's baseline. We don't really like this strip of this baby. It's a little too flat. Um, when we talk about late decelerations, I want you guys to make note that you would increase the oxygenation uh, to the baby and the blood flow to the placenta by changing the mom's position. Repositioning the mother is usually the first response in uh, variable decelerations. Make sure you know that. Variable, I don't know, all over the place, move them off. Let's keep going. We talked about that. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit of non reassuring fetal heart rate. Um, if you notice your baby has tachycardia, that's the baby's heart rate, is routinely um, greater than 160 for 10 minutes or longer. Um, that's what we consider tachycardia. Bradycardia, if the baby's heart rate is down. Um, less than 110 beats per minute for 10 minutes or longer. That is what we call bradycardia, or decrease or absent in variability. And so, let's see here. Hmm. This is a decrease in variability and no exhales. of pictures, pictures, pictures that you guys can't see because of Miss Corona. So, uh, on your slides, you're going to be able to see um, 
what early decelerations are so that you can see that mirror. So please pay attention to what that looks like and that baby's heart rate will come down and then it'll easily go back up. It will mirror. I just need you guys to make sure that you understand that. It will mirror, but notice they are with the contractions. So they are not variables. Early D cells, they are with the contractions. And late decelerations are just as I stated. They are late. They are all over the place. If you have a late deceleration and they are occurring um, after the beginning of the contraction and they do not return until the uh, after the end of the contractions at some point, these suggest that the placenta is not delivering enough oxygen to the fetus. And like I said, it is non-reassuring. And with the late you will, if the mom um, is on Pitocin, the first thing that you're going to do is shut that off. With lates, you will turn your mother on her side, put an oxygen mask on her. That Pitocin is off. You may increase your uh, LR or whatever is your uh, regular fluid that is um, running at that time, according to your doctor. If lates continue after you do the intervention, um, you would, of course, call the physician, let your charge nurse know, these kind of things. But at any point you notice some lates, uh, the doctor needs to be made aware. Let's see here. Um, there's a prolonged deceleration in you guys' book. I wrote down two pages. Um, I wrote down uh, page 136 and the interventions on page 142. Please look, but you will see that it's a prolonged deceleration and it will tell you what we would do about it. An example of why uh, mom may have that is that it is core compression or a prolapsed uh, supine hypotension. Um, sometimes it can be brought on by a regional um, anesthesia that the mom may be um, receiving at that time. So you have to really, really pay close, close attention to these moms uh, once they are laboring. Now I'm going to get done with this uh, chapter. We're almost done. And then we're going to um, end this one and then start the next one so that you guys will have more than one part. Um, so let's talk about um, immediate postpartum period. That's expulsion of the placenta, and that's included in the third stage of labor. Um, so it is either considered or noted or charted as Duncan's delivery or Schultz delivery. Now, the easiest way for me to remember that is, uh, unfortunately, we would call it Dirty Duncan or Shiny Schultz. And Dirty Duncan, which means the um, dull side of the placenta. So it's the side that looks kind of um, um, balled up. You know, it's the most membraned looking um, side. So they would call that Dirty Duncan or Dull Duncan. And then Shiny um, is what we call the Shiny Schultz. So when the fetal side of the placenta is delivered first, we call that the shiny Schultz because that's the part that is that encases the baby, the shiny portion. The dirty Duncan side is the side that's attached to the mom. Okay, that's how the nutrients and everything are getting through. So we do make a note of which way the placenta came out. So, we, and we would chart it as such, shiny Schultz or dirty Duncan. Okay, but you would just say Schultz or Duncan. But that is the best way for you to remember in your mind the two. That's how I remember the two. The fourth stage of labor is one to four hours after the birth of the placenta or until the mother is stable. This is the most important activity for the nurse is to prevent hemorrhage by fetal massage and assisting um, and assessing the mom, um, Lokia during this time. Observation of the bladder. Now we were going to have a uh, really nice OB lab, which I'm gonna still try to figure out how I can do for you guys and film it. Um, but this is an important part of the postpartum right after delivery is observation of the, of the bladder. 
Um, and the urine output is very important because if the bladder is full, then the um, uterus is going to be misplaced, which means that it's gonna be sitting to the side a little bit and it's gonna capsulate more blood and it is gonna become soft, it's gonna become boggy. And so the mother is more likely to bleed more. So we need to make sure that we are keeping her bladder empty. Um, the uterus will be higher than expected and it's placed on one side um, if her bladder is full. This will inhibit uterine contractions and it can lead to your mom hemorrhaging. Pain after vaginal delivery the perineum is usually bruised and very sore. Um, and I, would, I want you guys to know for this action, an ice pack can be applied for up to 12 hours to reduce swelling of her peri area. Then a warm pack may be used after the first 12 hours. Um, and the doctor may also order a sitz bath for the mom to help perineal healing. And we will give the moms what we call a peri bottle to help them to clean after they go to the restroom um, to avoid because this keeps the area clean and it keeps them from wiping um, from an area that's already, you know, very tender and sore. But FYI, the uterus should maintain a firm contraction. It should be massaged in order to maintain it to be firm during this whole period. Fundal massaging will go uh, we'll go over this a little bit more later, but that is a very important function that you need to know after delivery in order for us to make sure that our mother's just not going to uh, bleed out. Now we're going to talk a little bit, almost done with this chapter, we're going to talk a little bit about care of the newborn immediately after delivery. The first phase of caring for the newborn immediately after the delivery um, is immediate care after birth. And that's the first phase. It's immediate care after birth to one hour. And it's usually done in the delivery room where the mom is. And we'll discuss that a little bit more in the next chapter. The second phase is from one to three hours after the birth. And it's usually in the transitional nursery or on the postpartum unit. This is where this is done. The third phase is from two to 12 hours after the birth. And this is also normally done on the postpartum unit or in the room with the mom if they're rooming in, which is what a lot of hospitals have gone to. And you never base um, resuscitation on an APGAR score. Make sure that you know that. An APGAR score, it is a tool. It is only a tool. So I'm gonna talk about the phases just a little bit and then we're gonna move on. The first phase during that, that is initial care of the newborn and it includes uh, maintaining thermal um, regulation, making sure the baby stays nice and toasty, maintaining cardio respiratory function, make sure that you know the baby's heart rate, the baby's respirations, observing for urination, has the baby passed urine, has the baby passed meconium, Performing a brief assessment on major ab, uh, abnormalities, encouraging bonding or breastfeeding if that's the if the mother's choice is to breastfeed. If it's not her choice to breastfeed, we're going to still encourage bonding at that time. Um, the infant will be uh, have some blood on it, maybe and amniotic fluid, and um, all healthcare givers must wear uh, gloves when handling a newborn until the baby's first bath. Um, during this time, we will also get the APGAR score. The APGAR score is based on the heart rate, respiratory rate, muscle tone, um, uh, reflexes, response, skin color. This is on table dash, um, six dash seven. So you can look at that and please follow along. And it shows how they are scored. I'm also going to do a whole video for that for our OB lab, so more to come on that. And the infant can get cold stress very easy, so it's very important that we make sure the babies stay warm. Um, as soon as the baby is born, we start to dry the infant off with a towel. So we make sure that we're drying the uh, baby off. The towel, um, after it is a little bit damp, you want to just get another towel. A lot of times we just use newborn blankets. 
um, phase one care of the newborn is in your book. You can also make sure that you do that. And normally during this time, we're going to also do the eyes and thighs, which is the um, erythromycin that we do in the eyes. And then we give them um, their shot in their thigh, which is, that's why we call it eyes and thighs. And we do it together right after they're born. Um, and remember, we talked about that, why we put the ointment in the eyes. Um, so review that if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and then I want you guys to review skill 6-6 and skill 6-7. And also, it's not um, super important um, for you guys to know all the ins and outs of cord blood banking. But it is very important uh, for you guys to kind of know what that is. So um, on your own time, please read over that. I want to say it's on page 160. So you can read over that on your own um, about the cord blood banking. Um, so I'm, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and conclude this chapter. And then I'm going to go ahead and upload it so that I can make sure it gets up okay. And be sure to 